Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, and Symbolism. Beginning with Impressionism. So Impressionism was an art movement that was born in late 19th century Paris, and it was a reaction to the rapid societal change that was underway. So society was becoming much more modern and very quickly. Everyday life um, was the main subject of the Impressionists, and they wished to capture the impermanence and the transience of everyday life by painting casual moments. Many of their paintings were painted in plein air, meaning outside, and they were painted in reaction to what the artists were actually seeing. Many of the paintings were also painted in only one sitting. So the effect is that a lot of Impressionism looks like this. It looks very direct and it looks very much like a painting. To our eyes this might not seem particularly jarring but critics of the time uh, when they saw the Impressionists work they they just totally hated it. They said that this these paintings aren't done at all. You can see the brush strokes, this whole thing. It just it looks like a mess. It was only done in one sitting. It was painted outside and they called this artwork impressions, Impressionistic, and the critics gave it that name, but they didn't mean it as a good thing. They were actually using that as a criticism against the artwork, saying, this isn't a finished painting, this is only an impression, and an impression alone isn't worth looking at. Now, this painting uh, is the painting that a famous critic of the time wrote an essay about uh, disparaging Impressionism, and it is a painting by Claude Monet. Monet is one of the more famous Impressionists. You may have seen his paintings of water lilies. And Monet had a boat that he would paint from. And so did one of his other friends, Manet. And this is Manet's painting of Monet in his studio boat. And Monet preferred to draw directly from nature. Monet also uh, had quite poor eyesight, so his, his very famous, very loose paintings from nature might be painted the way that they are, in part because his vision wasn't focused at all. You can see Manet's painting has slightly more definition. Some of you may have seen the movie Clueless, um, if not, I don't highly recommend that you see it, but it is, it's, it's good for what it is. Uh, in the movie, they use the term Monet as an insult, so to save somebody else, she's like a full-on Monet. From far away, it's okay, but when you go up close, it's a real mess. You could say that of Monet's artworks. Here are some more of his pieces. Monet is quite famous for um, completing a series of about 30 paintings of the Rouen Cathedral, which is most famously the cathedral where Joan of Arc was executed. When you get really close to the paintings, you'll see that um, it doesn't look like much. It just looks like daubs of color. You have to step back from the painting to receive the full effect. Monet, in painting all of these different scenes of the cathedral, was trying to capture the way that the cathedral changed as the light of day changed. And he rented an apartment where he would have this exact view of the cathedral, and he worked on as many as eight of these paintings at a time, and he would switch which painting he was working on as the light changed. So he would work on one at dawn, and one at noon, and one in the evening, and so on. He was trying to capture impermanent moments of the everyday, which is essentially what Impressionism tried to do. Monet took as his subject um, mostly architecture and the natural world. Other Impressionists, such as Renoir, focused on scenes from daily life that featured people. Here we have a scene of a, an outdoor dance and cafe at La Galette. And places like this were becoming more popularized because of the advent of the Industrial Revolution. What I'm trying to say is that because of factories, people were working jobs where they got money and then they used their money to buy things that people that worked in other factories made. Um, this is a version of what we call capitalism. And capitalism opened up more time for people 
and it also brought about the um, birth of the middle class. So people would spend their time and money uh, when they weren't working doing things like this, which was relatively new. And the Impressionists wanted to capture this, this change in everyday life that was brought about by the Industrial Revolution. Degas is another famous Impressionist. You've probably seen his paintings of ballerinas. Uh, Degas was very fascinated by the ballet and also by the opera. And uh, he was also quite famous as a painter in his day, so he was given free access to all of the behind-the-scenes goings, goings on of the ballet. Degas often worked from photographs, so you can see that there's something that's very photographically precise in the way that he renders. But uh, his images, I think you could argue, are perhaps even more realistic than a photograph because they're more true to the way that the human eye sees. For example, when you look at the people in the background here, they're kind of out of focus, whereas most of your focus is on this person. And that's very true of the way that our eye sees things. You can't focus on everything all at once. And here is an image by Berthe Morceau, a female impressionist, of a summer's day. And you could think of it as a scene that nowadays we might take a picture of with our phone. It's just two friends hanging out on a boat. That's exactly what this artwork was supposed to be like. It was supposed to be very personal and very casual um, and very free. Artists during this time period had access to artwork from around the world and most notably the French artists were very influenced by Japanese prints. A lot of things that were being imported from Japan like <clears throat> porcelain um, and various china came wrapped in Japanese prints so uh, French painters would have access to these images. Japanese prints in general, I've got an image of one on the right, are very flat and they have large blocks of color. There's nothing in a Japanese print that's trying to disguise the fact that it is indeed a flat image, which is different than a lot of the artwork that we've been looking at up to this point. When you think about Renaissance painters, they spent their whole lives just trying to make paintings that didn't look like they were flat, the instead paintings that were trying to imitate 3D space. When French painters saw these flat images um, as created in the Japanese prints, they very much admired them and took aspects of Japanese compositions and applied them into their work. So you can see on the left is a painting, well not a painting, a drawing in pastel by Degas, and you can see that he's framed everything in such a way that um, the composition feels kind of awkward and strange and flattened. This kind of composition would have been very typical of Japanese prints. Van Gogh very much admired Japanese prints. And here he's he's got um, some fake Japanese writing and his very Japaneseified version of cherry blossoms. So he was very directly inspired by Japanese work. And here's a painting by Mary Cassatt. Um, and although uh, the figures within it are rendered so that they look very three-dimensional, you can see that the angular composition and the flattening out that happens because of all of the patterns is again very much influenced by Japanese compositions. We see during this time period to um, a shift away from artwork uh, that is quote-unquote representational in the way that we've come to expect and not just in reaction to the Japanese prints but also just because artists were really trying to rethink what painting was and what it meant to be a painter uh, in a time when society was changing so quickly and um, photography had just come about so they were trying to reevaluate the importance of painting that brought about images such as this one, which is uh, Whistler's Nocturne in Black and Gold. And in his paintings of this time period, he would often title them Nocturnes or Compositions or Arrangements, which are all names that were given to pieces of music. This here is supposed to be an image of fireworks, and Whistler was very excited about it, although critics of the time really hated it because they said it was just like nonsense, garbage, etc., etc. But Whistler argued that 
if you wanted to see a picture of something, you'd take a photograph, or a painter would go through great lengths to depict it very realistically, but then, again, that was kind of boring, because then, in the end, what do you have? All you have is just an image of a, an actual thing. It was more interesting, Whistler said, for artists to create work that was abstract, because then the viewer could make it mean whatever they, they wanted. It gave the viewer more freedom. And this freedom to be able to express one's emotions as opposed to just what was going on, like exactly what it quote-unquote looked like, is what was um, explored by artists uh, that we're about to look at, post-impressionists, but also by Toulouse-Lautrec. Toulouse-Lautrec, you may have heard of him. He was a famous figure of this time period. His uh, parents were very closely related by blood, so he was born with a genetic defect that made him really short, <coughs> and he was uh, kind of a party animal. So he was a real character and spent most of his life in brothels and nightclubs, and that's what his artwork is about. This here is a painting of um, his friends hanging out at the Moulin Rouge, and when this painting was purchased, the people who purchased it actually, if you look kind of closely, you can almost see the lines where they cut it, they cut the actual canvas right there and re-stretched it because they thought that this woman's face was too garish and too hideous. They didn't want to look at it in a painting. Nowadays, of course, it's images like that, like the more outrageous aspects of Lautrec's work that critics find so interesting. Let's look at some post-impressionism. So post-impressionists explored the same themes as the Impressionists, but they were more interested in the formal aspects of painting. When I say formal aspects of painting, what I'm talking about are color, line, drawing, how the paint is applied, the composition, um, but also what it, what it means to actually make a painting. They were trying to reevaluate what that actually means. This here is the work of Seurat, and you may hear the technique that you see here referred to as pointillism because it's created with tiny little points or dots of color. That was actually considered a derogatory term. Again, critics uh, thought this kind of work was absurd. They were like, why would anyone want to look at a painting that's made up of tiny little points? This pointillism stuff is absurd. And the people that were making pointillist paintings referred to it uh, as divisionism because what they were trying to do was divide every visible color into tiny little dots of color. Today we're very familiar with this way of working because if you look at the way that things are printed uh, when they're printed cheaply, for example in um, like cheap ads, if you look up close you'll see that everything is printed as a half tone which means that first yellow is printed and then blue is printed and the way that the tiny dots of different colors add up makes your eye see uh, the actual colors. So for example, when blue and yellow merge, they create green. If you were to see this in person, and it's quite large, it's uh, almost 7 feet by 10 feet, you would see that it's actually created by all of these tiny, tiny little dots of color merging to create a larger painting. It takes as its subject a scene of ordinary life, but it's made extraordinary because of the way that Seurat was really examining how a painting is made. Here's a painting by Gauguin, and um, you can see that it's uh, uh, sort of an everyday image. We have nuns, but what they're, they're looking at is quite extraordinary. They're looking at uh, Jacob wrestling with the angel, which is a... Um, uh, biblical incident. Gauguin was famous for mixing in the absurd with the real and then also uh, for using colors in a way that was very very expressionistic which is to say that it expressed his emotions but not the real world. His composition is flat and very unexpected. The way that that tree cuts the painting in half um, is sort of an homage to Japanese prints, but is very uh, unfamiliar to the, the Western history of painting. Gauguin was the intimate friend of 
Van Gogh, who most of you were probably familiar with. I chose to show you this image of Van Gogh's work um, because it's so very exaggerated. Look at the, the composition of this. <clears throat> the way that perspective is being shown, it makes it feel as though that the floorboards are tilting down and the ceiling is lifting up as though you're getting sucked into this image. The way that the lamps are sort of vibrating light and the, the garish and also conflicting colors of green and red are supposed to convey an overwhelming sense of anxiety and disease. Van Gogh said when he painted this that he wanted it to seem like a scene where somebody could lose their mind or commit a murder. Van Gogh himself was a very emotionally troubled individual. We have records of all of the letters that he wrote throughout his short um, life, which was unfortunately ended by what is supposed to be a suicide, although recently people have proposed that it could have been a murder, where he was shot in the stomach. Um, uh, but he spent his life in and out of asylums and was never recognized as a painter and his work was never given a much critical note. And it wasn't until long after his death that people came to really appreciate his paintings. <clears throat> this here is potentially his most famous painting. It's called Starry Night. And it was painted shortly before his death. He painted it in an asylum. Uh, what exactly it means is sort of up for debate. You see that there's a church featured prominently in the lower center and that all the stars seem to swirl and because of the way that things are painted again the paint is very heavily applied and the colors aren't naturalistic the emphasis is on the pattern that the paint creates and the pattern that it creates seems to tie everything together maybe suggesting that everything in the universe is is connected I have here uh, a little thing that Van Gogh wrote about Starry Night that I'm gonna read you uh, or not a about Starry Night, sorry, that he, he wrote during this time period. And he wrote, Perhaps death is not the hardest thing in a painter's life. Looking at the stars always makes me dream, as simply as I dream over the black dots representing towns and villages on a map. Why, I ask myself, shouldn't the shining dots of the sky be as accessible as the black dots on the map of France? Just as we take the train to get to Tarcassonne or Rouen, we take death to reach a star. So perhaps that's an insight on what this painting could have meant to Van Gogh. Moving on, let's look at some symbolism. So symbolists were um, artists who rejected the real world and they painted fantastic <clears throat> or imagined images. They were often very inspired by their dreams. They were also inspired by poets, um, uh, philosophers, and psychologists of the time and they wanted to portray the psychic condition of the modern person. Now it turns out that the psychic condition of the modern person, as they portrayed it, uh, was often full of anxiety because the world was changing so fast and because modern life um, brings about a lot more questions and problems than uh, life before when people had been focused solely on surviving. This is perhaps the most famous symbolist work and you've probably seen it spoofed somewhere or other. It's called The Scream by Edvard Munch. And Edvard Munch was a northern European artist who's famous for his um, images that are all kind of in this vein. They're all kind of melancholy. He painted this when he was 30 years old and it was inspired by an incident after he'd been out drinking with his friends and then they were crossing the bridge afterward. I have here uh, what he Edvard Munch actually wrote about the painting, and he said, I was walking along the road with two friends. The sun was setting. I felt a breath of melancholy. Suddenly the sky turned blood red. I stopped and leaned against the railing, deathly tired, looking out across the flaming clouds that hung like blood and a sword over the blue-black fjord and town. My friends walked on. I stood there, trembling with fear, and I sensed a great, infinite scream pass through nature. Originally, he was going to title the artwork Despair, but then settled on the screen. And I feel like uh, this, this image here has really come to um, encapsulate a lot of artwork that we see that was made 
uh, in response to what we would call the modern condition. Not all artwork was, uh, uh, not all symbolist artwork was so emotional. We have here Gustave Moreau's The Apparition, which is uh, perhaps a picture of Salome. Uh, uh, she requested the head of St. John the Baptist, and she got it. So this is a picture of her, but <clears throat> the way that he painted it is very dreamlike and full of fabulous details that have nothing to do necessarily with the biblical incident. I should mention as well that a lot of symbolist artwork was quite misogynistic and featured women as being terrible and evil tempt temptresses, such as this one. Um, but not all of it was misogynistic, as displayed by The Kiss by Gustav Klimt. Um, this, this artwork is quite interesting because it's so flattened. We saw an interest in flattening images when we were talking about the influence of Japanese prints, but this here takes it to the next level. Uh, the hands, the feet, and the faces of these two figures are modeled, but everything else is uh, portrayed as a flat surface. Gustav Klimt was very interested in design, as were a lot of artists of this time period, and when I say design, I mean the way that surfaces are treated, and the way that architecture is treated, and the way that um, household objects were made. And he's treating a painting in a similar way. Here is the Casa Mila by Gaudí, who is a, was a famous Spanish architect. And um, he originally studied how to work with steel, but then came to design his own buildings because of his uh, very intense knowledge of designing with steel. He understood how to construct, and he chose to construct buildings that were built in a very unprecedented and unexpected way. It feels as though his buildings are undulating, like they're moving, and he would use, uh, as reference for his architecture, natural forms. With this one here, he said that he was referencing caves that were carved out by the sea, and many of the portions of this building were actually made by casting uh, from forms that were constructed in clay. So even though it's made of uh, very hard materials, it looks as though it were constructed out of something soft. And then finally we're going to end with the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower, when it was made, uh, please keep in mind that it was almost universally hated. Most people in Paris thought it was terrible, that it ruined the skyline, they were appalled by it. Um, but shortly after that, everybody came, uh, or I should say, most people came to change their mind, and it became the symbol of Paris. When it was constructed, it was the tallest building in the world until 1931, when the um, Empire State Building was constructed. <coughs> and it was also the, the first major structure that was built in this kind of a way, with this kind of modular steel construction. Uh, uh, Eiffel, when he was constructing the tower, he wanted it to remain skeletal so that it could truly integrate itself with the Paris skyline, meaning that you, would, um, you can ascend it and look out over the top to view all of Paris, but as you're viewing it from the ground, because you can see through it, it seems to contain Paris within it. It became a symbol not only of Paris, but of the modern world at this time period. And that concludes today's lecture.